morning is basically the current event and end times. Current event and end times. There's no doubt that uh, when you turn on the TV or listen to the radio or just read any tabloids uh, that comes around, you'll discover very quickly that one of the focuses that we have right now is some of the civil war that's going on, especially among others in the Middle East and uh, so-called Arab Spring and the current crisis that is happening in Syria and the United Nations and uh, the superpowers like uh, America, <coughs> Russia, and China are all in uh, bewilderment as to what to do and how to go about it. And uh, allegedly they say that there has been some chemical weapons that has been used in times past and in recent periods where over a thousand people have been affected is kind of a atrocity because um, international laws forbid you from actually using chemical warfare. It's been a treaty that's been signed a long time ago. So um, while the evidence is still streaming in, whether it happened or it didn't, um, uh, President Obama from US made a statement that uh, the red line he would not uh, have crossed is when chemical weapons are used. And so before he could uh, do something about it, whatever it's going to be, um, Russia who has always been sort of a protector of uh, Syria and some other parts of the world for strategic reasons, uh, oil and stuff. And uh, they've intervened and they wouldn't let any veto be passed on the UN because the countries like Russia and China is veto power. So even though all the nations comes together and decide on something, they can just veto it and say, we, we don't agree, we disagree. So it's a very unusual period of time because if you go back, uh, those of us who are still uh, alive and around right now, just some years ago during the Iraq war, um, uh, America more or less just decided to strike and the difference in the scenario is that at that time, uh, politically, as well as uh, economically, let alone military-wise, America, uh, you, uh, Russia, as well as China, were not as um, significant as they are today. But as time has gone on, and we have gone through this economic crisis recently, and from the, from that period till now, uh, while some of the Western countries, like EU as well as US, have been in some ways suffering financially and trying to recover from that uh, financial. Um, Depression. Uh, countries like uh, Russia as well as China has actually been flourishing um, in the context of the time that we are living in. And therefore, uh, they have economically um, flourished. And China is also one of the biggest lenders of money around the world. And so, as a result of that, the military is also, of course, doing better. And, and they seem to have a bit more political strength. So, today, uh, the, the world that we are living in. Uh, the demography has changed a little bit politically and otherwise. So thus, the uh, US is not able to, uh, together with its partners, be able to just intervene in another country as they used to. So things are basically changing in a very, very significant way. That's just politics. And then I think we have enough of politics for today. But let's look at what the Bible says. And I'll try to share with you uh, very briefly some of the things and why it's very significant. Uh, what's going on in Syria today is very, very significant because it could, I'm not saying it will, and please don't look at me as a prophet today, you know, I'm not a doomsday prophet who's going to stand here and prophesy uh, what is about to happen, but this situation in Syria could possibly trigger another war which possibly may engage many countries which we could easily term as the third world war. We hope not, we pray not. And I'm not here to make you panic, as Andy said. Sometimes you feel like you're standing in the water and all of these things are above you. But let's look at God's word today for two reasons. One is to draw comfort from his word. And the second reason is to what can you and I do today? What can we act and how can we respond to it? For that reason, we want to go to God's Word, so that when you leave this place today, you will feel like you are walking on water. Amen. Amen. How many of you want to walk on water? How many of you have ever walked on water? If you have lived in Denmark long enough, believe me, you walk on water every winter. <laughs> There's ice everywhere. It's frozen, and you're walking on it. I walked on water in Denmark. <laughs> 
Hallelujah. Amen. I'm looking at that chicken. Look at me. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Now I want to uh, just draw your attention. If you have the scriptures or your iPhones, iPods, whatever top, uh, device you use, otherwise just listen to me. I'm reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 24, and literally the entire verse, the entire uh, uh, chapter. So it'll. Just give me a little bit of time and bear with me as I read it. And uh, for the recording purposes, maybe you can edit this part out so that you can get a bit more time for it. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things? He asked. I tell you the truth. Not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. You gotta understand the context. This is the Jewish nation. Herod's temple, a significant temple. His attempt to rebuild what Solomon did, and it's a, a real, you know, it's like the Eiffel Tower. Or if you go to some other countries, you look at uh, some prominent buildings, and the temple was really the prominent object in all of Israel. And the, and the disciples were proud, and everybody was proud of it. It was like a tourist attraction. And Jesus said. Look at this. He said, not one stone will be left on the other. Of course, the disciples were completely shocked. They know that even the Babylonians tried to destroy it and burn it down. But eventually, in AD 70, this happened with the Romans came. They not only burned the temple, but they destroyed it. And they literally took the, the pieces of stones apart, not one stone from the other. Because when they burned it, there was slabs of gold which actually kind of melted and went through the, the columns and it was in the building. So in order to obtain the gold, they literally, like Lego, had to take the building apart. And this, that Jesus said, came to pass. Isn't that awesome? The disciples were unaware, many of them were not even around at that time. Verse 3, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered. He said, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you're not alarmed. He said, there were many false Christ that would come and said, I'm the Savior. And then you will hear a wars and rumors of wars, but don't be alarmed. In other words, what he's saying is, don't panic. Turn to the person next to you and say, don't panic. Don't panic. <laughs> Tell him once again, don't panic. <laughs> All right? And then uh, take a deep breath. <sighs> and relax. Don't panic. All right? And then we go on. He said, such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Very important. Nation speaks of ethnos in the Greek. Ethnos is ethnicity. There will be many ethnic wars, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be many kingdom clashes. Kingdom speaks of cultures, speaks of uh, not more than ethnicity, speaks of nationality. Europe against the, 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 the East, and the East against the West, it's um, also uh, more than nationalities, it's also part of uh, systems. There will be clashes of cultures, clashes of systems. As we go on further, he says here, there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginnings of birth pains. Famines as a result of war, war usually creates a lot of economic problems, which as a result creates uh, famines, and in case there's any um, spilling of nuclear activity, for example, even into the ocean, food gets poisoned, and the ground gets uh, poisoned, you, you have famines as a result of that. Jesus said all of these are the beginning of birth pains. Uh, please bear in mind that these things will not, these things have always happened, there's always been wars, there's always been earthquakes. But what he's talking about is that during this period, things will happen simultaneously. It's like these things are happening together. Um, one time I was in Uganda, when I was still a pastor, and uh, very rare you get, you get uh, earthquakes. <clears throat> on, you know, uh, but one day in the night there was this earthquake where all the roofs were rattling, and I didn't know I was asleep. 
Apparently, according to those who are awake, you know, the beds were actually shaking. But I was so deep in sleep that I didn't know. I just slept through it. Next, it was a Saturday night. So Sunday morning, I got up and I was in church. And the church was packed. It's just people everywhere. There was no room to sit and everybody was standing. Then I asked my sister, I said, what happened? Uh, he said, uh, did, you, did you feel it yesterday? I said, what? He said, there was an earthquake. Everything was shaking. I said, I didn't know. I said, is that why there's so many people in the church? He said, yeah. I think they're all got frightened and they want to hear. So I had another sermon. I think I was supposed to preach about love or, or peace or joy or something. And then immediately I changed my sermon. I stood up there and I told them, I said, today I'm going to preach about end time. And everybody like to lean in. Amen. But uh, these kind of earthquakes, they happen all the time, you know, they're all over the place. But the fact is, Jesus said that uh, uh, it will kind of uh, culminate, it happens about the same time. Then something significant happens. He's speaking here to the Jewish nation, but there's also significance for us Christians, who are sons and daughters of Abraham as well, in the spirit realm. Listen, he said, then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. Some of these wars, it's not only because of um, king ethnicity or kingdoms. There will also be an element of religion involved in it. And as a result of this, for some reason, uh, any, anything connected to Judaism or anything connected to um, Christianity will be uh, very much affected. It will almost be like a clash of religions. Uh, in my uh, idea, I might be completely wrong. I think that there will be something very much uh, between Islam and, and Christianity, where there will be a clash to a point where overwhelmingly anyone who associates them with Christianity or Christ would be hunted down in one way or another. This is not to frighten you, but this is just to let you know that it's reality. It's uh, easy to sit in church on Sunday when we are all Christians. It's going to be a different scenario one day when you're walking down the street and somebody's looking for anything that smells or looks like Christianity. And that's when the rubber hits the road. And that's when it sounds like, am I still following my Lord? He says, you'll be hated because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. There'll be a time during this time when people's security gets affected. They start betraying each other and say, oh, you're looking for that guy? That's where he is. And he's a Christian. I'm not. There's going to be a lot of uh, ugly scenario in this period of tribulation. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most people will grow cold. It's very interesting because in the King James Version, he says that we all have been talking about, you know, how the world thinks are getting bad and the world is getting wicked. But it, the King James Version it says, the love of many people will wax cold. It's like a drop of wax, you know, when you have candles in your dinner and sometimes you accidentally drop a candle on the table and it, wax, it, it goes dry very fast. So the, the love of many people, because of the increase of wickedness, will wax cold. It will be happened, boom, so fast they will be like, I, 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 I'm not as loving as I used to be. And um, I want to find out where we stop reading because of me. And many false prophets, as he said, will appear and deceive. He said, because of the increase of wickedness, people's uh, love will wax cold, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. You see how, how, how kind Jesus is. He always gives hope. He says, don't panic. He says, yes, things are going to be, be bad, but you'll be saved. Isn't that wonderful to hear that you can be saved? And the way to, stand, to be saved is just to stand firm. Amen? Stand firm. Hang on to your faith. Hang on to your beliefs. Hang on to your God. And stand firm. Don't be shaken. Don't be panicked. You will be saved. Turn to the person next to you and say, You will be saved. Amen. That feels good, doesn't it? <laughs> Alright. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. The end will come. When? When the gospel, 
the message is misplaced. The gospel is good news. The gospel is not religion. The gospel is not about Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, and whatever other religions you may have. That's not the gospel. The gospel is about each individual having an opportunity to create direct connection and contact with Christ in order to have a personal relationship with Him. He is the Savior. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen? And I want to once again ask you, and beg, beg you, please have a personal relationship with Christ. It's wonderful to come to church. It's wonderful to know Christians. It's wonderful to do all the religious things that you're kind of used to, maybe because of your tradition or your culture. But have a personal living relationship with Christ. It is He who can save you. Amen. Nobody else can serve you. The church can't save you. The pastors can't save you. The Pope can't save you. Even if you're related to uh, a religious figure. I've got two sons and I'm very happy that they are born and raised in my family. But they can't get to heaven and say, you know, I've got access because my father was the pastor of ICC. And they will say, I don't know. I only know people individually. Amen? God only has sons and daughters. He doesn't have grandchildren. Amen? So therefore, develop a personal relationship. And that's private, that's individual, and nobody can judge that. That's between you and Him. I beg of you to have that relationship with Him. Verse 15, he says, So when you see standing, and this is very interesting because this is something I want to draw your attention to. When, so when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then let those who, you see, Matthew was writing this, so even Matthew is re rephrasing what Jesus said. He said, let the reader understand. Then those who are in Judea flee to the mountain. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of his house go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get his cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in the winter or the Sabbath. For then there will be great distress unequaled from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again. Um, I want to read the rest, but I just want to give you a quick scenario as to how or where we are right now in the scriptures. The temple that has been destroyed, Jesus spoke of earlier, and then now he speaks about the abomination that causes desolation that is in the temple. And you're like, hang on a minute. I thought you said the temple was going to be destroyed, right? Yes, it was destroyed. As a matter of fact, still destroyed, still not rebuilt. A very important, significant event that will take place in our history. This is in our time. Keep your eyes on Israel, because in the midst of all this war, Israel will start to rebuild the temple once again. This, my friends, is very, very significant. Now you're talking about the end of the end. Because before that happens, there will be unequaled um, tribulation in this world. Politically, economically, financially. The, the systems of the world will be in such a chaos that the entire world will come together and agree in one voice, maybe under the charter of the United Nations, to say that we are sick and tired of wars. We don't want wars anymore. Why are these wars there? That's because of, 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 of ideologies. It's because of religion. It's because of, of, of geography. Now we want one world government. We want one currency. And we want one religion. The world will be so dying for a leader that one will rise above the rest. And this the Bible calls the Antichrist, who will even be apparently assassinated at some point and come back to life. And that will be the sign for the world that this guy is divine. So the one world religion and the one world government and the one world um, uh, economy, uh, in fact the one world economy is not even going to be currencies, we're no longer going to have euros or US dollars or, or mastercards or, or you know, credit. Visa cards, all the currencies are going to be implanted into you. You're going to have one system. It's either going to be on your right hand or on your forehead. It will be a chip and you, you will be registered through this system. And everybody who doesn't want to receive the sign, it's called the sign of the Antichrist, would be put aside because you are 
the threat for the security of the world. You would be the terrorist of the sanctuary. Are you following me? Uh, it's pretty interesting to see these things because uh, these will happen uh, in a period of time when we will be surprised. It will come so quick, so fast, and you'll have a choice to make. Uh, let me go further before I start. Okay, before I go further, let me also just quickly pull this in uh, for the sake of time. Uh, just understand that we, are, we have some very significant events that takes place in the world. I think it will be very helpful if I can borrow four people. Can I just borrow four people to just help me? This helps any four people. Yeah, one, two, three, come. John is always my. Oh, there's Wolf here. One, two, three. Okay, Prince can take a break now. Come, John. John is always good because I need someone from the Middle East. <laughs> it's all because of him that we are having trouble. <laughs> you may have to zoom in with the. Yeah. yeah, no, no, come, okay. I'm from the Middle East. I'm sorry. <laughs> we have, we have, okay, let, let's just call this uh, 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 person creation. I'm saying person because I'm having problems with names now. <laughs> and then we have the cross. It's very good, yes, I see here, because this is a very significant event in life, the cross. Okay. <laughs> and then you can step a little bit further here. Super. This is what we call the coming. The second coming. Just go do it. Yes, I like it. The second coming. And then, and then here we have the final judgment. That's why we least. <laughs> okay. Now, from creation, from the period of creation, where God created heaven and the earth and so on, and then came to the period of the cross. This is one significant period where the Old Testament was. So loads of things happened until the day when when Abraham met God and then Jesus came. This is a significant period. And from this period until what we call the, the second coming of Christ, where Christ is going to come back, there is a, a, a very short period. This is the church age. This is the time you and I are living in. So, there's about 2,000 years from here since Christ died. And this is a very important period because you and I we are living somewhere here at this time before the temple is going to be rebuilt and so on. And the Bible says that Christ is going to come back at some point. Nobody knows when He's coming back. It will be like a twinkling of an eye. Bang! And He's back. But that's going to happen. But after this period has happened where Christ has come back, you find that there's going to be a very painful, short period actually. Pretty, pretty short. It's only about seven years. There you go. It's only about a pretty short period here where there's going to be great tribulation and then comes the final judgment where books are going to be opened and people are going to be judged by God. During this period, before the whole world is judged according to whether you belong to Christ or you don't, there's also going to be some judgment up here because if Christ comes, He will take the Christians with Him, those who believe in Him, and they will go up and, and in heaven there's a huge celebration for seven years there's a wedding. A wedding where, where, where Jesus takes his bride to be with him. And during this period of wedding here, where there's a great celebration going on, just down in the basement on earth, there's some of the worst periods of time, the worst seven years you can ever imagine. And then comes Christ back, and he, when he comes here, he doesn't land on, on the earth because he just comes, he takes them and he leaves. But now he comes, he lands, and the judgment is made and the tribulation is gone, and then comes the new heavens and the new earth. So this is just some significant period in history. Are you following me? Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So just to give you a little picture of, of where we are right now, we are in what we call the church age. The church age, this period where things are going to happen. So, Jesus was talking to even the disciples, the Jewish disciples, about how things are going to take place. Now, uh, just a little bit more reading, and then I will try to explain to you about uh, the significance of the Jewish... I tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll do this first before I, I, I give you the significance of the, the, the message. You see, in the Jewish culture, when you actually get married, it's a, um, there are stages that you go through. And if you understand that, it makes it very easy to understand what Jesus does. In a Jewish culture, when you get married, there are different stages. 
The first stage of the marriage is to be betrothed. That's a very old English word, betrothed. Um, in our uh, day and age, we probably understand it as engagement. Does that make any sense? Before you get married, you get an engagement. So, in the Jewish culture, if a man uh, likes a woman, he, he will be betrothed to her. And then it's announced to everybody that now I'm betrothed to her. The thing is, in that culture, to be betrothed is a very, very serious thing. It's not a light thing. It's almost, almost like marriage, except that you're not sleeping together yet. Except that you've announced, this is my woman, and everybody knows it. They stays away from her because she's booked, and they're waiting. That's how it goes. It's a very serious thing. And in fact, a betrothal is so serious that you only break it by divorce. If you can remember the Bible, the Bible says that Jesus, Mary was betrothed to Jesus when Jesus, uh, uh, to Joseph, not to Jesus, that would be terrible. Okay, and see, I'm terrible with names, so you have to get used to this. And uh, even my wife is so used to it. Sometimes I, I have couples in the church, you know, maybe uh, John is with me and then maybe Andy is with Sandra. I go to John and I ask John, hey, how is uh, Sandra? And he looks at me, he's like, why is he asking me how is Sandra? But you know, I just got the name to all mixed up, so it's a, it's a disease. I hope God will heal me. <laughs> and so, uh, anyway, then you have the betrothal. Then, then uh, uh, you know, Joseph said that, uh, oh, I, I didn't realize he's pregnant. He was thinking quietly to divorce her, even though they're not married yet. But then the angel said, no, no, it's of the Holy Spirit, don't, don't uh, divorce her. And so he took his wife and didn't lie with her until Jesus was born. Now, after betrothal comes the actual, uh, uh, what we call the arrival of the uh, uh, bride. This is a secret. This is where the bride will tell uh, the, the bridegroom, uh, 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 the bridegroom, the bride. The bride is the girl, right? <laughs> so uh, the bridegroom will tell the bride that uh, July, I'm coming in July. That's it, in July. But you will never know exactly when. So every day, she, the bride wakes up and she looks out the window, gets the house ready. She said, it's quite a panic thing, it's quite stressful too, because you don't know when it's going to come, day or night or what time. Because at any time you come and suddenly, the, 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 the bridegroom arrives with, with a big entourage, you know, and they announce, but ah, we are here, and then there's this big uh, celebration. And so the bride's like, ah, he's come, he's come, and everybody gets the village, gets to know, they turn on the lights, and you know, the little lambs, and everybody gets excited, it could be the night, it could be the day. And then he collects her, and he takes her with him to the father's house. Are you with me? They all always tell So when he takes her with him to the father's house, there they have a party, a big ceremony. This ceremony can go on, sometimes for days, for weeks, even for months. It's a very long ceremony. So depending on how rich the family is, they want to show off. And then when the ceremony is over, the wedding is taking place, and it is sealed, now she is married to the bride. Are you following me? It's exactly the same because when Jesus said, you know, uh, he, when, when, when Jesus came to this world, he came because of his love for us, humanity. And the betrothal, the, 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 the engagement ring was, he said, I'm going, but I'll send you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit became our engagement. It's a journey that we take together. It's soul food from the heart. In God, we're united in our differences. It's a place of getting in touch with God, others, and your destiny. Come and visit ICC, the International Christian Community, a church where great things come together. Oh.